And I was singing and playing guitar in a band, um, and I'd actually auditioned for the band that Kitty was in before Kitty had joined it. So I kind of knew this this band that Kitty had joined subsequently, um, and was a big fan of them, and wanted to do a gig with them or something like that. And ended up supporting them at a show in London, and I turned up, walked in, and Kitty was their keyboard player, and she was new in the band. And when they were playing, I was just like. It just the pity just like exuded something that I hadn't really seen musically <laughs> and I, I yeah I thought it was like magnetic really as a performer just playing keyboards like in a six-piece band that's all right um, and yeah I remember saying to my friend someone's like I, I want to do something musical with her like I just I could just tell I was like this is what I've been looking for in a like musical partner um, and Basically, kind I guess of. Guess I felt the same. <laughs> yeah, I just like forced you into it to yeah. some extent. But Kitty was living in Silvertown, like near where um, where we are now, like East London, like itself, like the airport, and just this like rundown, horrible area. And I needed a room. And Kitty had a room, and so I moved in, yeah. and we just lived in freezing cold, drinking wine and talking about the band we wish existed and then set about creating that band, basically. We have very different influences, but the thing that's uh, similar is artists who have a kind of single-minded vision um, and they go about uh, creating it with kind of a no-nonsense... Uh, just being bold about it, just not being scared of trying to execute what they want to do. At school, I didn't. I had one friend who liked music I liked. No, everyone else was into dance music and stuff. I would just stay up until 2 a.m. whatever, and the rock show would come on on Radio 1, and I'd press record on my tape player and I often fall asleep. Um, and then on the way to school the next day, put it in my in my Walkman and, and listen to it and just be blown away by what I was hearing. And it was like all this kind of like 90s metal stuff and everything, and it just felt illicit and exciting, and it was someone recommending it and going, you know, so I'd go to these gigs and, and then John Peel was the other one. Um, and this is the thing that winds the rest of the band up, loads of the band, is that I love like really extreme metal. And John Peel was the person that turned me on to it. There's a band called Nile that he was really, really into um, and defiantly played on Radio 1, quite prime time radio. Black Seeds of Vengeance was the album. <laughs> and, you know, that stuck with me that I, I, I hadn't had anyone say, you should listen to this. There was an adult, a grown-up that looked like my dad, you know, saying, this stuff's cool, it has artistic merit. And that really was an exciting thing for me that, okay, well, if that, that's at the scale of, like, way beyond 10 and has artistic merit, so everything below that is fine. Like, before that, I doubted if what I liked was somehow stupid because all the kids at school thought I was stupid and would shout Slayer at me and things. Do you feel you need the uh, approval of a middle-aged white man with your uh, taste? Sad, 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 <laughs> sadly, sadly, yes, I, do. sadly, I do. Yeah, <laughs> and not long. I can just look in the mirror and tell me that that's cool. <laughs> British artist that I've loved in the last fifty years is PJ Harvey. Um, in particular, her album "Stories from the City," "Stories from the Sea." Um, as a whole album, it's just like. It is a beautiful collection of songs, the melody stuff in there is incredible. Uh, and the storytelling as well is um, uh, really like connects with, with me. Uh, and for such a big album, I think her vocals just really raw and like, it's, I mean, it's quite well produced. The St. Agnes sound, um, quite raw without it being lo-fi it's not intentionally underproduced in any way but we don't do any tidying of anything a um, huge part of what we do is our live performance so uh, when we're recording we try as much to capture that as possible yeah that kind of wild unhinged there needs to be a few mistakes in there um, if you're really really good and really well rehearsed band 
um, you can get to the point where anyone could be you to some extent, you know, like if you were house really hard, anyone could play that. It's a real good excuse for being loose. <laughs> being loose. There's bad playing and then there's overly proficient playing and, and then somewhere good, in the bad middle. Playing, which is well weird. Yeah, and so our sound is trying to find those tiny little grey areas in that middle part and then bring them to life in multicolour. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we were going to be the band that we wanted to be. Um, and actually we realised the best thing to do is just keep it incredibly simple. We have a horrible little rehearsal room that we set a few mics up in and recorded some demos and we listened to them. We just thought it surpassed in energy and spirit everything that we'd done kind of properly before. Um, and so we just that was the live tracking and then we did some vocals like okay so this in a better studio is how we're going to record so we went to a place called uh, Tile House Studios and um, they had um, they've got this Studer two track 16 channel tape machine and a Studer desk and we recorded their simple mics all playing live vocals overdubbed afterwards that was it and Recording to tape as well has certain limitations, so you can't like go back and do something again and again. Yeah. And that was really important to us that we uh, put those limitations on ourselves because once you when you have like, endless opportunities to redo something, um, I just I don't find that exciting. I don't find that exciting. We don't know. And Our it... kind of main idea is to be bold with everything we do, so recording to tape fit that perfectly. Witching Hour came out of the sessions that we did um, for a whole like album's worth of material. Um, and this is recording totally live to tape. Um, halfway through recording that song on the first, well we did it, got halfway through a take, made a mistake, wanted to rewind, and it turned out it couldn't rewind. It was broken and we had another five days left in the studio. So the only option was to take the tape off, flip it over. I think there was only one uh, bloke who could fix a tape machine. In the country. In the south of England. Yeah, so. and he was like not free for another two weeks, something like that. Uh, and so we like flipped the tape, had to fast forward it, and then flip it back over to then have another go. And we did one more take of it and got to the end of it and like, we don't. We're not like yeah. flipping that tape. Again. Not flipping the tape again. We're winding it back again, like <laughs> that will have to do. And there are definitely wrong notes in there, but we were just like, it was a thing in a moment. Yeah. Just and it's not, it's, I think, sometimes this kind of thing can be seen as laziness, and it's not. It's just living with that was the performance in that moment in time, and that has an, a thing about it. Um, so, quite a few producers we like to work with. Uh, one in particular is Nick Lorno. Um, so, he's worked with loads of people, but uh, the album that really sticks out to us is the first Grinder Man album. Um, I think they recorded it in like four days and the ethos behind it is uh, bold decisions. So for example in the song No Pussy Blues, um, there's a guitar that comes in that is just like inappropriately loud. Yeah, it's like a school. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. If you're listening with headphones, it's like, yeah. what the fuck? Obnoxious. My God. Um, but it just fits the, uh, what the whole message of the song is, this frustration of like, not getting any, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's kind of a, just a crazy decision, but just, it's so bold and so exciting. Um, yeah, so Nick, you know, And then amazing. the other one, Vance Powell. Like, just like, he's my favorite kind of producer because he's more of an engineer than producer. Mm. Um, and so he's there to facilitate your ideas as well as just, Put his own on it, and that first Dead Weather album, I just think, is one of the best sounding things I've ever heard. And he was the man behind the desk for that, so yeah, just he doesn't need to do anything else. And he's my kind of engineering hero. And we were supposed to work with him, yeah, um, we almost did. Chatted with him about working together, but we flirted, we, by we flirted with Vance, but it didn't come to yeah. So if Hopefully Vance is watching this, say. then you know, we're still, up, we're still king, we're still very king. <laughs> There's two really key ones. One is a guy called Dave Holmes who works at a studio called Super Studios. And um, we just booked some time there because I had a good gear list. Um, and I met him really briefly at the studio and he just seemed like a good guy. And we forced ourselves to go in, write some songs before we went in. And he helped us kind of find our sound really by standing back and just letting us be what we were. Um, and we learned a lot 
about what we want to do and what we don't want to do through through that session and it resulted in us having maybe enough kind of overconfidence to decide that we're going to produce the next thing we record and so we wanted to just find an engineer um, who had access to really good gear and it's a guy called Luke Oldfield at Tile House Studios. So Luke Oldfield is the son of the famous Mike Oldfield so I think that's where he gets his musical genius and inspiration from. Tuba Bells. There are a lot of Tuba Bells memorabilia around the studio. Um, but we, yeah, we, Luke engineered what we were doing. We, we went in there and we kind of bossy about what we wanted to do and less microphones on everything, keeping things really simple. We just had a audio aesthetic in mind for the whole thing um, that we just had learned from working with Dave that we're like, we know what we want better than anyone and there's no way of communicating artistic vision other than just doing it. So we just said to Luke, set these mics up, this it, you'll hear what we want to do and do it and then we just work together on that and it worked out really well, you know, there's some mistakes, there's some stuff that we might have done differently in hindsight but it has a sound, it has a thing, it was a moment in time, we made decisions, bold decisions that... And Luke was kind of perfect for taking a back seat, I think a lot of people wouldn't be so happy doing that but Luke was great for that wasn't he, you know, us kind of... He opened doors in the studio and just let us get on with it and that for someone who owns a studio and knows what that gear can do and sometimes to let us do something inappropriate with it, you know, that's kind of, that's cool, it's good. The music we were writing, like, to be honest, didn't suit that. We talked a lot about having a kind of two-piece band where it would be very, like, easy to recreate live, just the two of us, but the music we started writing were these kind of uh, rock operas <laughs> um, with like epic kind of uh, western cowboy parts in them and we were like we're going to need to have a band. We need a band. Uh, also out of the sessions that we recorded at Tile House, um, all this tape goodness that we're pressing this one to vinyl and it's called the Death or Glory Gang EP. Um, oh it's on my jacket actually. Yeah, so Death of glory. See that. <laughs> see that. Anyway, so yeah, we're um this is five songs, which is the first part of a longer story. That's what I can say at the moment. Um and we're incredibly proud of it. And I heard the masters the other day. It sounds exactly how we intended. Couldn't be happy.